I'm not a media expert, I'm not involved in producing media, I just use media to get Christian views out. That's, so that's really my involvement and what I'm going to be talking to you about is largely from the perspective of a practitioner who sees the media as a means to communicate to the world and something to love and not to be afraid of but to see as our, as our friend and ally rather than something that we should shrink back from. And uh, I suppose part of my journey is going from that position of fear to, to uh, seeing it as a welcome opportunity. And if I can just tell you, the first media thing I ever did was back in about 2001. And I've been watching, as the head of student ministries for Christian Medical Fellowship, I watched my CEO, uh, the position I'm in now, uh, doing lots of things on the media, and I was terrified about it. And I was advised, uh, when you start, start with friendly, recorded radio. Friendly, so that's a Christian program, okay? Recorded, so if you make a real mess of it, it can be edited out and it will all look good on the day. And radio, because they can't see you. <laughs> I was told I had the face for radio. <laughs> so, uh, so armed with that advice, the... <laughs> The first media opportunity I've, I ever got was hostile live television. <laughs> but you don't choose, you see. And a very good friend of mine who was a, a, a Catholic who'd done a lot of things on, on media, a whole lifetime of beginning and end of life issues. And she said her specialty, she was also a New Zealander but lives in Britain, her specialty is pushing people off the high diving board, she said into the water, however reluctant they are. So I, I was one of these people. She pushed off the high diving board. So I get this phone call, and I found later that it was her that had put me up to it, and I had to go and do hostile live television. It was, it was some beginning of life debate. And I was really, really scared. I, I was trembling all the way through it. And I, I tried to assemble my thoughts and wrote them all down on paper, and I put them in my case uh, and on the taxi on the way, I was checking and checking, and I shut the case. And I was so anxious that I forgot the combination lock for, <laughs> for my bag. <laughs> so I had to force it open <laughs> and break the lock. And all I was sitting there in the studio, and it was a debate. I was up against some expert who'd been doing terrible things with human embryos, and I was the bad guy. And uh, I, was, I could hardly hear the uh, presenter's questions because my knees were knocking so much. <laughs> anyway, so I got through it by God's grace. But, and people afterwards, I think what encouraged me is uh, people who came, they said, oh, you, you actually did, did okay, and you didn't look scared at all. Mm -hmm. As they, they, they just didn't know how I felt inside. So you know, we all start from a point of weakness, and God's strength is made perfect in weakness. And, and part of being involved in media is you, you've just got to be up for it and be willing to say yes and to take the opportunities on. And then you do find that God gives you the, the courage and he, he also gives you the words to say and he gives you the skills along the way. And uh, it's amazing. I've, I've often watched, you, you watch people uh, on media uh, dealing with the kind of debates that, that you do regularly and, and you think, well, if I, if I was asked that question, I don't know what, quite what I'd say. But actually, when you're in the heat of the action, under the lights, being asked the question, you always have something to say. And, and the Lord really does give us the words. And he, he puts, I, I think that the Holy Spirit puts ideas in our minds. And, and I find, generally, I'm formulating the next answer when I'm listening to the question. So a lot of it is about being prepared to take the leap, jump off the high diving board and be pushed as I was, and uh, say yes and be up for it. So uh, where do I come from? I, you know I'm a New Zealander. I was a surgeon like this, but for the last 25 years I've worked for Christian Medical Fellowship, uh, nine years in student ministry, and, and uh, 15 or 16 now as CEO. And that's where the, the media stuff became uh, part of what I do. We have a public policy department, but as the CEO I, I need to do 
some of the stuff as well. So we are a fellowship of 6,000 doctors and medical students throughout the UK and Ireland, and we, we united equip them to live and to speak for Jesus. So, but advocacy and public policy is, some, is, is part of our work. And then uh, Tony said also, there's a group called Care Not Killing, which is an alliance of about 40 organizations. We set it up in 2006 to combat a bill that was going through parliament trying to legalize assisted suicide. Um, it brings together uh, religious groups uh, that the, uh, of all faiths, uh, atheists, disabled people, doctors. It's a big co-belligerent alliance. The only thing we agree on is that euthanasia is a bad thing and that care is a good thing. But we don't talk about anything else because we, we, we disagree very profoundly on <laughs> other issues. You know, you never talk about transgender or uh, gay marriage or even abortion. Uh, in, in the, but the real heart of this group, uh, and I, I mean the energy, all comes from evangelicals and Catholics working together. That's where the energy actually comes from and the leadership comes from. Now, uh, we're living in a very hostile time with the rise of militant secularism all the way through. So God doesn't exist, death is the end, man's a clever monkey, morality is what we decide it to be. Uh, and uh, th it's that view and that liberal elite which is infiltrating all the corridors of power in, in Europe, whether it's parliament, the judiciary, the universities, the institutions, uh, the professions like medicine and law, or the worlds of media, art, and entertainment. It's that militant secularism that's there. So it's, it's hostile out there, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a voice. And we now live in a, in a time of a global village where everything is connected throughout the world uh, by the internet, and uh, there are, is a huge explosion of different radio and television stations, and of course social media as well. And what that means is that anything that happens in a small corner of the world can become a, a, glo uh, become a national or an international global news story very, very fast. And so that creates the whole environment of what we call the shark fest. The shark fest is where you get thrown into a pool of water and the sharks uh, all come and you know, the sharks are the journalists and media people and they eat you up and, and spit you out. And uh, the way the media works, it used to work, of course, by people uh, hearing there was a story and taking their pad and going out with their pen and interviewing people and coming back and writing it up and it would all be printed out. And of course, now they all just sit in front of their television screens and they watch the news and they watch what other people are doing and then they just copy what other people are doing. So if something becomes a story in one quarter, it just spreads very rapidly and uh, the top story in the news can change very, very quickly. So it means you've got to be prepared for all sorts of things. And of course, there's a whole area of social networking as well, Facebook, Twitter, and blogs and things. And uh, all newspapers now virtually are online, and reactivity is a much bigger part. So you can go up and give a rapid response and get into an argument, and, and they say that usually the, the argument very quickly moves off the, artic the, the uh, issue that's been discussed, and it's the same old people who are saying the same old things because they just love arguing with each other. So there's a huge amount of dialogue going on all over the world, and, and this is the modern day Athens. Paul in Acts 17, you know, people love to talk about the latest thing. The media is now where they love to talk about the latest thing, and there are lots of people listening in the comforts of their cars or bedrooms. So why should Christians be involved in it? Well, a wider audience. I can get up on a Sunday morning before church, and go to a radio station and sit there for two hours and uh, have 10 different regional BBC radio stations ringing me up every 10 minutes for uh, an interview on an issue of medical ethics. And each one is heard by 100,000 people. So I can arrive at church at half past nine in the morning having already spoken to a million people all over the UK. And we've got quite a big church for the UK, it's 300, you know, and you think, and they're all Christians. So, but to get out there and hear uh, and, and get into the living rooms of people, uh, it's a wider audience. If, you, if you're on BBC World Service, you might have 50 million people listening to you all around the world, depending on what footprint it is. 
And so it is, it is that opportunity. Of course, there's the opportunity for dialogue as well, because people love interaction best of all, just like in Athens. They love to hear the philosophers arguing, and they love to hear people arguing on radio. So the best kind of radio is where there's interaction and, uh, and uh, aggression, hostility, disagreement, and debate uh, and argument. And uh, another reason for getting involved is because it, I think it really does give Christians confidence. If you see Christian believers on the media saying the things that you believe, hopefully in a way that comes across effectively, it, it builds your confidence as a Christian. And, and, and when we're out there doing these things, we are speaking uh, for the Lord, but we're also speaking for all our fellow believers as well, and being a voice for them. So there are good reasons to be involved. Now, how did the apostles do evangelism? Well, we're studying the book of Acts, and, and we're learning all these things, but there were three key principles. They did it in words people understood, first of all. So you notice how when Paul and Peter are talking to different groups in Athens, they use different illustrations, different words, depending on the audience. You see how Paul is different speaking to people in the Jewish synagogue than he is on the streets in Athens, for example. So we've got to translate out, get out of our Christian jargon and use words that people understand. They did it in a place where people felt safe. So they went to them, talk to Jews, go to the synagogue, talk to philosophers, you go to the Areopagus, talk to people in, uh, in Jerusalem, you, know, you, you go to the, the temple or whatever. Um, so uh, where do people feel safe? Well, in neutral environments, where they, they feel very, very safe in their own living room or their own car. And uh, that's the beauty of, of the media. And you do it in the context of dialogue. We've talked about that already. And, and I think it's all about taking thoughts captive because Satan's, Satan's power base is wrong ideas or ideology. And, and we've got to go out there and capture that wrong ideology with the truth. And that doesn't just apply to the proclamation of the Christian gospel, which you very seldom will get a chance to, to uh, give on media. You might, you might get a chance. But usually what you're doing is, is giving truth that's based in a Christian worldview to counter lies that's based in a non-Christian worldview. And that is equally part of, of, of the battle because uh, we're, we're living in a post-Christian age and you have to start way, way, way back with the presuppositions of where we, we start from and build the whole Christian worldview rather than just preaching the gospel into a, a vacuum. And uh, all through scripture we can see uh, people in the middle of discussions which were difficult and, and threatening or in battles. And uh, just a few principles, Second Kings 6 is, is about Elisha and his servant and they're surrounded by the enemy armies, and the servant's very intimidated, and Elisha prays that God will give the servant the eyes required to see the chariots of fire around him. And we are never alone, however we f may feel that we're alone. This is a spiritual battle where the, you know, the forces of, of good are helping to protect us, and the Holy Spirit is giving us utterance. Uh, a firestorm, uh, 1 Kings 18, of course, is, is uh, Elijah on... Mount Carmel. Well, now we know there were 7,000 who hadn't bowed their knee to Baal, but he felt pretty much all alone there, but he was taking on uh, these prophets of Baal who were putting across the message of death. And it's uh, always important to remember that God is in control and he's sovereign of these situations and he's given us the promises in our spiritual armor to wear, but it really is a spiritual battle out there. And so we need to have our helmet of salvation and our breastplate of righteousness and our sword of the spirit and our equipment of the gospel of peace and so on. And I remember when I, was, uh, as a medical student, first got involved in the abortion bake, a debate back in, in New Zealand and I, I went to the leaders of the CMF to, to talk about what we could do. And, and they said to me, they said, do you realize, Peter, that if you go into this debate, you will be entering a spiritual battlefield and uh, you'll be taking on the enemy, and you need people praying for you, but you also need to be aware it's a spiritual battle. And we, we must have no illusion about, about that. Now, these are the different avenues, the press, obviously radio, television, 
but then uh, new media as well. And if you, if you want to get involved in doing media in the, in the secular world, then you've got to be involved in, in social media. There's no question about that. And, and I, I get uh, opportunities that come out of my blogging. You know, I, I, oh, we're on your blog and we read this. You know, would you like to come on the radio and talk about this? And so uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, blogging is a good way of being out there. And I, uh, one of the things about blogging, this is my blog, Christian Medical Comment, and most of what I write about is medical ethics, it's beginning and end of life ethics, sexuality, marriage, um, you know, developing world medical issues and that kind of stuff. But I do some basic apologetics on it, and I do some other articles that have nothing to do whatsoever with medical ethics or Christian apologetics, but are just interesting about New Zealand or you know, pop stars or something like that, or, or rugby, which I'm absolutely passionate about. So it's a game played with an abnormally shaped ball in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is an example. Why Christians may eat shellfish, but may not have sex outside marriage? And this is based on the, the, the apologetics question you get today. So, oh, so you believe the Bible's God's word, do you? So does that mean you don't wear clothes made of different sorts of clothing or eat shellfish, you see? And, of course, the whole thing is then how, you, how can you say sex outside marriage is wrong? It's just another archaic command. You're cherry-picking the commands. You're only taking those things that you really want. So I try and deal with these sorts of issues. And this is, this is one of the most popular um, pages, most popular articles on my, on my blog. And the reason for that is that you can see it's a few years ago, 2013, been blogging for about seven years. I'm less active now than I was because unfortunately I have more work to do at CMF running the organization. But um, this is still live and it still goes and it's the title that draws people in. So you put seductive titles on things that pull them in. So this is another one, the slaughter of the Canaanites, was it justified? So I, I wrote this and then I tweeted it to Richard Dawkins, you see. And so Richard Dawkins retweeted it to a million people. <laughs> and then I, uh, the, the hordes descended upon me, you know. So, and, and I had some interesting debates on, on Twitter, but you know, there were lots of people coming and at least reading this, and maybe some of them were picking something up. So, so being provocative can be, can be helpful. Uh, Twitter. Uh, the only people who are really interested in Twitter are decision makers and media people, the politicians, media people, and celebrities, and the people who follow those three groups of people. It, that, and that's what Twitter is all about. But it's actually really important in engaging people in positions of responsibility and power and influence. And so that's why it's important to be on, on Twitter. And I, I keep my Twitter feed going uh, you know, I'm upfront about who I am, director of Christian Medical Fellowship, Care Not Killing, formerly general surgeon, evangelical Christian, Kiwi blogger, broadcaster, opinions my own, you see. And that gets me off when I say things that uh, might upset people in the Christian Medical Fellowship. I can say, well, it's my own views. And this had to be negotiated with the board. But I use this to flag things I've written, but, but mainly I, I just keep a general flow of articles that have come out that are interesting on issues in the interface of Christianity and medicine. And that's so you get known as a source, people follow you, and then that they will propagate your things elsewhere. Now, having said that, I don't think Twitter is the best mechanism for, for getting uh, things out and widely read. Actually, Facebook is. It's something that not many people appreciate. So what I do is if I'm writing something new, I put it up on my Facebook page as well. So this is last article, Brilliant Resources to Help Christians Engage with the General Election on the 8th of, of June. I put it on Facebook and then people will share it and you'll get a wider uh, distribution. And in fact, um, th th this is th my, my page view, so this goes back over the whole life of the blog, but uh, you know, generally you won't get, you'll get a few hundred or maybe a few thousand views. But then things will go viral and you'll get you know, 200,000 views on abortion and premature birth, the, the link. Or this next one, do you know what happened to the girl in this picture? And, and that was that uh, little girl running after the napalm bombing in, in Vietnam. 
uh, to, through the streets. You remember naked with the burns? And I, I put that up, up on my blog because I heard her speak, wrote a story, put it up, 165,000 views. But actually, it, it was Facebook. It got into the Southeast Asian Facebook community and got shared all over there, but also reposted on other websites. And the other websites that it was put up, you know, some of them got millions of views. And so even though you're, and then the next one, great female vocalist from a very long time ago. What's that about? Well, it's just something I was interested in one Sunday afternoon and wrote a blog on. But it, it, these things, they bring people in and then you get, you get now and then they follow you. But the, the, the way to think about a blog is not so much that the whole world is coming to read your blog because you might have a fairly small leadership, readership. But the blog is a, a, a portal to other places. It's people who take your articles and republish them on sites that really do get a lot of coverage. And, and journalists will come to get you done and they'll come to read and you get media opportunities out of that. So you, you've got to be involved in, in social media. Uh, how do you influence journals, journalists? Well, if you can afford it, your organization can. Use a media consultant, we certainly do. And we, we've worked with a group called MIP, Media Intelligence Partners, now for a total of 10 years. And the director of that group used to be the head of news and advisor to the former uh, leader of the Conservative Party. And he's very well connected. He was a political editor of the Times and the Daily Express. And, uh, and he's Catholic. And he's totally with us on all our issues. And he gives us service at a very low rate and his whole team help us. So what that means is that when people contact us, my phone isn't going off all the time and I'm having to deal with a journalist. What happens is these guys deal with it. They know where we stand. They'll sometimes do media things themselves. They'll farm them out to different people and they'll, and they'll sieve through and, just, and pass on what they think is most important. So if you can afford it, it's important. Identify sympathetic journalists. They really do exist, even on uh, secular newspapers. And build up a relationship with them and feed them. They love to be fed. And they know that if they treat you badly, you'll stop feeding them. <laughs> so so, so they have, you have to feed them well. And I know organizations in the UK that are most effective at this have some pet journalists and, they, and when the journalist sees it's them on the phone, they're always picking it up because they're going to get a story which will scoop everybody else and put them ahead, which is what they want to do. Uh, but it's really important to present your message on a plate because uh, journalists generally are all rushed and pulled. And I mean, many of you will be involved in this. You know you've got so little time and you love the people who will give you all your work already done. And so you really have to take the time and preparing it and and Nick Wood who is our who runs uh, our media consultancy uh, he's always saying Peter it's all about presentation you have to give them the story on a plate and then uh, it's it will be much easier for them it, it's as much about convenience as it is about the the story <clears throat> uh, how are you you, you get prepared. Well, uh, we all like to be proactive. Uh, the, the fact is that in the society we're living in, we're often reactive, to, but, but you can still have a voice if you're not the one lighting the match. But uh, you need to stay connected. So I have various news feeds that come in. My, my, um, one of my sons works for a, another Christian public policy organization in the UK, and they have a guy who gets up at five o'clock every morning and has uh, you know, 20 news feeds, and he spends two hours reading everything on a whole range of issues from beginning of end of life to Islam to marriage to so on. And then he puts down a curated report of maybe 30 news articles and emails it out at 10 to 8, uh, sorry, 10 to 9 every morning. And so I, I get going in on the train. I'll check. It's always in a five minute window. There it is on my phone. So the time I've got to the office, I've scanned all of these and I've clicked on a few links and I know exactly what's happening all around the world in our area and, and what 
uh, we could potentially to respond to. And then that is, we have a guy in the office whose job is just to tweet and do social media. He does two days a week for us. He does some research as well. But in the same way, he's looking through all the medical journals to find out the news stories. And so that's the basis. So when I'm, I'm tweeting things, I'm not necessarily, I'm not finding them myself necessarily. I've got people telling me about them, and then I'll generate them in, or, or I'm retweeting things that we've tweeted on our CMF sites. So you've got to stay, you've got to stay connected. Um, horizon scanning, uh, uh, looking for what might be coming up in the future, diary planning, and uh, you've got to agree the strategy and position on the various issues on which you're going to speak and decide what those things are. And then I, I think, of course, media training is important too. And I, I did um, some media training very early on before I'd done any media, and it was helpful. And then I did another half day, which was more helpful after I'd started. And I think it can help you to shortcut to learn some basic uh, things that will save you a lot of time and embarrassment possibly as well. But, uh, but really, the best way to do it is by doing it and, and being out there and then learning from the mistakes. And, and I don't think I've ever done a media interview where I haven't come off afterwards and thought, I could have been a bit crisper with that. I should have said this. I, I could have made that point more clearly. You know, so you're, you're always being self-critical in a helpful way that hopefully will make you better the next time you, you take it on. And so uh, this is Care Not Killing, our anti-euthanasia group. And this is a page on our website. And this is our position, you see. Now, you can't see the whole thing, but there are 12 short paragraphs, each of them only a sentence long, that describe exactly Care Not Killing's position on a whole host of issues on things at, at the end of life. So any change in the law to allow assisted suicide or euthanasia will put pressure on vulnerable people to end their lives for fear of being a financial, emotional, or care burden. And this will particularly affect those who are disabled, elderly, sick, or depressed. Now, if you listen to all my interviews on End of Life, you'll, you'll, you'll hear me saying that virtually verbatim in a whole lot of different contexts. And so you've got to decide what your message is, what your best arguments are, have them marshaled, and then be ready to get them out in the order of priority, not wait for the, for the opportunity. Uh, and, and then having a position statement, it's clear, people come to your website, they know exactly where you stand. If you're briefing speakers to, to speak to you, if you're in a firestorm where your organization gets asked to do 40 interviews on national, regional, and international media in a 24-hour period, it happens, then you need lots of people to do it. And so you've got to brief them. And so if you have briefing statements already sorted out, then it's very clear that they can pick up what your messaging is. And messaging is incredibly important to keep consistent because someone who goes off piste or off message can do a lot of damage to the, the and miss opportunities as well. So uh, these are, depending on the size of your organization, it might be one person doing all of this stuff. But at Care Not Killing, we have a campaign director, which has been me for most of of uh, CNK's life, who oversees the strategy, but we have a small strategy group now, three or four, who meet together. A press officer feels calls and allocates media opportunities. That for us is MIP. An office administrator. So we have a full, one full-time guy, one, just one staff member. That's all we have in the office. So we punch well above our weight, but, but he's absolutely invaluable. He can write, he can put things up on the website, he can research things, he can answer questions. And so uh, there's always a response coming up to, to the issues. And uh, he, he summarizes what's happening, keeps us informed, writes reports for the, for the committees and so on. Media spokespeople, uh, most things you can deal with just one or two people, but if it's a real firestorm, you might need, and if you know that a bill's being discussed in Parliament on a particular date or a court case is coming up on a particular date, then you know ahead of time when it's going to be and you can plan and, and uh, brief people beforehand. And then a researcher chasing up the information needed um, in the campaign. You know, you're on media, just, just been asked a question, you didn't know the answer. You come off the phone, uh, ring the office and say, look, can you just get me the facts on this issue and, and, and brief me? 
so that now I don't want you to get the impression that we're doing this all the time uh, because media by its very nature is very episodic and you might go for several weeks without doing anything at all and then there'll be a big story and you're doing 20 interviews in two days or then it might just be that you'll do two or three in a week on one subject or it might just be a one-off. Uh, so that's the, the nature of it. In terms of being prepared, um, <clears throat> uh, this is a essential equipment, laptop or tablet, smartphone. You can do just about everything on a smartphone now, of course. Press releases, media briefings and articles, uh, a website uh, to, to get your views out. And I think along with that partner website. So on the euthanasia front, there are three websites around the world who, who are most active in this. So there's Care Not Killing in the UK, there is uh, Hope Australia in Australia, and then probably the, the most active of all is the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, which runs out of Canada. And those of us who work on it and run these sites all know each other, we're good friends, we work together, we're involved in international conferences together, and we borrow from each other. So we'll run each other's stories so we're not having to regenerate the same stuff, and we're reaching a wider audience in that, in that way. And then, of course, you're your speakers list. So, handling interviews. Get your messages out early regardless of what they ask you. So, uh, on television and radio, it's, it's not like preaching a sermon where you can work up to your main point or even writing an essay. But it's not about even building an argument because you don't have time. You might get one soundbite in a debate. It might just be 20 seconds in the news. It might be a debate where you, you and your opponent each get three shots of a minute each. It might be a panel discussion where you're fighting for airtime. It might be a studio discussion where there's 30 other people all trying to get in. And in, in a half hour, all you might get is one sentence. And so, you have to know what your key messages are and your key arguments and you get them out really early because you might not get another opportunity. And you get them out whatever you're asked. And I think an art, an art uh, you have to learn quite early on is usually the first question from a journalist is the last thing you ever want to answer. But you cannot look like you're evading the question. So what you have to do is deal with it very quickly and then move on to your argument. So the thing I will say more often uh, than anything else in media interviews is something like this. Uh, and that's all very interesting, but the key issue in this debate is, or uh, yes, but we have to realize that there are two key questions you've got to ask yourself before you can answer that question or even begin to contemplate it. Now the only thing that they can say then to you is, well what are those two key questions, you see? Or otherwise they look like you're, and if you've got two or three points then, then say, so that you see the audience is all expecting and wanting to know what points two and three are, and so then that gives you a license to go on talking and talking, uh, uh, regardless of what the interview is doing. And of course, if you're on radio in the studio, then uh, your listener can't see the presenter waving his arms and going like this, you see. So you just uh, keep on talking. Uh, and and you know, even if, if you see them signaling, but, but not to the, the point of rudeness. Uh, look for opportunities. <laughs> look for opportunities to turn the interview around. And um, you know, on rare occasions you will get this. And I remember I, I, was, I was doing a debate on BBC Radio 4, which is the main national news program, on the link between abortion and mental health. And the Royal College of Psychiatrists had put out a report uh, covering lots and lots of studies. And, and I was in there, it was a debate and there was the key author of the report who was a PhD and the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and you know, big, and then there was me, Christian Medical Fellowship. Well, I was the bad guy, totally 
the bad guy, just to be dismissed, you see, and this other guy was to be, to be worshipped. And, um, and, I, and I, I, at one point in the interview, I, I made the point that 98% of all abortions are done for the mental health of the mother when there's actually no medical evidence at all that continuing a pregnancy uh, poses a greater risk to the mother's mental health than having an abortion. And that, that, that was the basis of, of, of the law, you see. So I, I made that point. Now, he'd been on to me at that point, and, and the, it was John Humphreys, some of you will know. So John Humphreys sitting on his chair, and his mouth went open. Now, people couldn't see that because it was radio. And he just said, 98%. <laughs> and I said, yes, 98%. He said, 98%. <laughs> I said, yes, 98%. So, and he nearly fell off his chair. Then he turned around to this other guy and he says, 98%. <laughs> and the other guy said, no, I think it's 95%. <laughs> well, I mean, who, who had won at that point, you see? So from being the bag, now that, that doesn't happen often, but there are sometimes moments when you can say something that will just, and all the guns go off you, and, and that you see the other chaps being machine gunned down, you're just there enjoying it. Um, <laughs> uh, be pleasant and passionate, or never get angry. Uh, it's really good if you can get the other person angry by being pleasant, uh, because you've won the argument. And I, I was, uh, remember a time I was, I was in a debate with a guy called Philip Nitschke, who was a, an Australian doctor who kills people through euthanasia and he promotes uh, ways of killing people on the internet. And, and uh, I knew, and all of us know in this, in this whole international group that we're involved in, that you win when you get Philip angry. And the way to get Philip angry is you quote on the radio things that he has said in the public domain that are embarrassing for him. And so I, I had prepared, I had all this stuff he'd read. And so I said, you know, well, Philip, uh, you are on public record as saying that euthanasia should be available for 12-year-olds and people with dementia. And, and he, came, he came back, read the article, Peter, read the article, read the article. I said, well, I happen to have the whole article in front of me, you wouldn't want me to read it. Read the article, he said. So I read it out, and it became more and more incriminating. He got angrier and angrier, and then he hung up. And uh, they had to ring him back. <laughs> and then he came back, apologized, and then he got angry again and hung up again. They rang him back, and he wouldn't answer the phone. And, and, that, and so then I was there alone as the... <laughs> I don't to get the idea that this happens very often, but, you know, Try and be pleasant, try and use humor, even when you're in the toughest situation. Um, decide what issues you'll focus on and which you won't. So there are things that you definitely say, you know, am I the best person to do this who's available, or is there someone else? And, and you know, refer to others who are, are much better. Don't try and be an expert on everything. So I, I generally stick only to things that are both Christian and medical when it's, um, you know, I, I don't speak on same-sex marriage or, you know, or uh, something, for example. Other people do that. Uh, find out what kind of interview or debate it is. That's the most important question. You know, what are you wanting from me? Is this a 20-second soundbite that you're going to record and put into a news item? Because if so, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about exactly what I want to put across and rehearsing that. And and uh, if, you're, if you're doing that, I've been in situations where you know, they're out there with the camera and you're on the, on the lawn and they're asking you a whole host of questions 
and I've just given the same 20 second answer to every single question. Because I know that nobody's going to see me doing that, but that's the only thing they can book. <laughs> and, then, and then they'll, they'll take it. Um, and that way you can at least have some control over a thing over which you've got no control. Or is it a, is it a debate where you're up against someone else? Is it television or radio? Is it live or recorded? If you're up against, is it just you and the interviewer? If so, who's the interviewer? Where are they coming from? If you're up against an opponent, who is it? Probably be someone you, you know already, but then you can go and look up what they've, they've said. And I, I remember I was, uh, I, I was actually, I, I agreed once to do a debate on witchcraft, and I, I was up against one of these white witches, you see. So I asked them, who, who am I up against? And, and they told me the name. So I Googled this person, and, and found all the stuff that they did, and it was some really, really crazy stuff that they were doing. And so I printed this out and brought it in and then used it uh, in the interview, which was, there's, so the more you're prepared beforehand, and then decide what your key messages are and the language you're going to use to, to put them across as well. And, and particularly getting memorable sound bites and trying to encapsulate a whole art uh, issue in a few words. So, we, we, had, uh, we had a debate over the General Pharmaceutical Council in Britain uh, introducing uh, new guidance which forced pharmacists to, dis to uh, dispense drugs uh, against their conscience, so emergency contraception or certain HIV drugs and, and so on. So we thought, how can we really encapsulate this, and we, we came up with the idea, writing our submission, that they were changing a right to refer to a duty to dispense. So right to refer, duty to dispense. And so it, it encapsulated the whole idea, and so when they put together the news program, they actually used that in the, in the thing. So I've hinted about anxiety anyway. I mean, the thing about anxiety is that you, you actually need to be a bit anxious because you perform better, particularly in live interviews, if, you're, um, you, know, if, if you are more uh, keyed up and, and anxious. Um, but actually, the anxiety gets better as you go along. If you do things again and again and again, it doesn't phase you to quite the same way. And especially if you're debating issues that you've done lots and lots of times before, you might not even have to prepare. You could do it just off the cuff. But generally, I will spend a lot of time to preparing and make sure what all my arguments are. And of course, if you're on radio, uh, sitting at home, uh, you can have notes in front of you, which you can't do on television or even in a radio live studio. Uh, reticence, you know, or, you know, just this fear of going out. We, we've got to overcome that and be willing to say, to say yes and, and trust the Lord. Uh, clarity, you know, oh, I could have said that so much better, and then hopefully next time you will. There's the issue of pride as well, you know, that you're out there and people are, are saying. I think the best antidote for pride is to be actually very self-critical about yourself, first of all, so that whenever you do an interview, you think, well, actually, it wasn't that good because I could have said this or that, or I started with this and there was an um in the wrong place or, or, or whatever, or I didn't cut to the chase. But also, you think, well, uh, they're all God-given opportunities, and you can only do it because he's giving you the words and the ability anyway, so, you know, or, or the gifting to do it, so what is there to be proud about? You know, it, it, you're just doing your duty before the Lord. And then there's the whole issue of publicity addiction, and, and this is, it is an issue if you, if you are in, in a firestorm, you're doing a lot of media, and you get into kind of media mode throughout a day, going from one studio to the next, and there is almost a kind of addictive quality about it that you have to be aware of, that you that you can become addicted to publicity and seek opportunities rather than wait for God to give them to you, and and maybe take things that you should have said no no to. So I think those are some of the some of the challenges.